Hello, Levi. Hello. Are you ready for your interview? Ready as ever. All right, blessed be. Blessed be. All right, so to start with, tell us something about yourself and how you came to live in New Orleans. I came to New Orleans for my profession. I'm a teacher and an interpreter, um, and I moved here to teach, so it brought me to New Orleans. Uh, why did you join the New Orleans Coven? That's a long story. Uh, I think the main thing was I had tried so many other things, and when it comes to finding a group for a spiritual practice, whether it's something really traditional, something modern, something big, something small, you know, something with dogs. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, they did fine. It's nothing. Um, when it's any of those groups, though, the big thing is to find something that clicks more than searching out ideological purity necessarily. Necessarily, and so when I came here, that's what I found. It worked, and what works is what's important in the grand scheme. So that's why I chose it. All right. What was your magical background before you joined? Uh, mostly uh, Catholic mysticism, Hermetic Kabbalah, the Western occult tradition in its, all of its various forms, Renaissance astrology, uh, tarot, divination. I think that's many people's gateway into uh, craft or into other esoteric traditions is tarot cards and you know horoscopes and stuff like that. But uh, for me, it was the Hermetic Kabbalah and sort of finding out that there was this current of Western philosophy that even the church kind of kept, you know, Thomas Aquinas and all of the scholastics kind of kept the Neoplatonist alive and the Stoics alive and they wanted to make Seneca a saint in some ways and whatnot. And I found that in Catholicism, but they still had to mix it with this very base sort of um, dogmatism and whatnot. And then when you find hermetic traditions and esoteric traditions, you find out that it never died, that it's always been there. It just kind of was kept alive by occult groups more than it was mainstream institutions. So, What does being Alexandrian mean to you? Uh, it means being a priest. Uh, most esoteric traditions do not have the mythos that we do, which is that all members are priesthood. Uh, that is a particular British craft thing. There's no such thing as a laity, and I think anybody interested needs to know that, and that it's very important. So if you come into it, you should approach it the same way you would if you were telling somebody you were gonna go join a seminary for four years, or you were going to um, you know, go live in Nepal on a mountain and you know, become ordained as an abbot or whatever. But people forget that because a lot of other pagan traditions and modern traditions that have you know, borrowed a lot from British craft, they've given up that mythos. They don't consider themselves priests. Not everybody in their, in, their, in their groups are priests. They have a priest or they have a priestess and then everybody else is whatever they have. But for us, there is no such thing as that initiation is priesthood. So to be Alexandrian is to be a priest. Um, and that's a life of all the good things that we like to talk about, like power and magic and you know, spirituality, but it's also service. Can you share with us a personal magical success story? Light is like a, like a really good game of light as a feather stiff as a board, or like a <laughs> wonderful Ouija board experience, like uh, that one time that we were sure it was Liberace. No, um, I, think, I think the word magic is very off-putting to people outside of the occult, and I think that we in the occult forget this. So we think that we get so used to using this word that we forget that in modern society it's it's you look like a kook. I mean, if you start talking about your magical success when you, you know, healed a friend or, or made the plants grow or got rid of the mice in the house or whatever, like you read in books. And so I'm careful with that word sometimes, but I do think it is successful. Um, what I think is the most successful thing about it is that you can literally transform yourself and your life. Like you don't have to... Um, you don't have to make it something that is Harry Potterized in any real way. It can be just transformative, and I like that. That would be my biggest success story, is that you just decide what you want to be and you do it. And I know that takes a lot of things out of the equation, like oppression and things like that, but it's still agency matters. And a belief in magic, in the Western sense, kind of keeps that alive. Does this dog make you happy that I don't actually raise human beings? <laughs> Is he spoiled? I love your dogs. Do you think he's spoiled? Most of the time. Do you think there might be something wrong with him? They're adorable, by the way. Uh, really cute dogs. <clears throat> yes, but this one might have a little bit of a crazy attitude. Um, who are your top three goddesses and why? And he wants Ronaldo. Um, <laughs> late 90s Madonna? No, um... Uh, I know, right? It's a sin. No, um... I think, well, first, ours, our goddess is my top goddess, like, above all others. Um, 
you know, we have our own names for our goddess, we have our own uh, culture, our own mythology. Um, I think it's very important that we draw from classical mythology, Celtic, Hellenistic, Greco-Egyptian, whatever. But it's also important that we have our own, and I don't care how modern it is. You know, modern, the fact that whether it's modern or ancient is irrelevant to me, it's true. Um, truth with a capital T. So, uh, she's number one, right? And then two well, and three. Very I just bright. got very bright, right? <laughs> See, I'm blessed. I am chosen by ours. I spoke for her. You're all heathens. You picked some foreign gods. And you, no. Uh, I didn't. You didn't. Uh, She's number one in all of her incarnations. All goddesses are one goddess. Do you have any other favorite? Uh, if I had to pick like named goddesses, uh, Diana is huge. Um, uh, Isis, the Egyptian Isis, um, especially in her like Greco-Roman uh, guise. Uh, all the Kel I'm really into Celtic mythology. Uh, I love um, the goddess as Caradwen, as the cauldron keeper. I love her as uh, you know Danu of the fields and all that. Um, the mother of the Danube River, the mother of the Celtic people. So um, I like all of that. Who is your favorite witchcraft elder and why? I should say something horrible here, like Anton LaVey, like somebody who doesn't <laughs> even like just make everybody be like what? Um, um, it's. If, yeah, I want to say Maxine. I want to because I feel like I have to. Uh, no, I adore, I adore her, and she was a huge reason, like reading her works, why I became what I am, whatever that is. Um, and it would be sycophantic for me to say that my favorite are my teachers. I'd be, you know, I get. I'm brownie. not an elder. I know, I know, but I get brownie points. I don't even pretend that you wouldn't be flattered. <laughs> like, if I was like, you are my favorite <laughs> above all others, great teacher. No. Um, of course, Maxine and Alex, but if, yeah. if, I, if you take them out of the equation, because it's kind of not fair, right? Um, actually, it's Gerald and Doreen yeah. and Patricia. I mean, it's the Gardnerian elders because the liturgy, everything, it's so much tied into them, their history, how brave they were. If people forget that. They always think of them as these kooks in the 50s and 60s, and it wasn't like that. You know, they were really um, doing something that meant a lot. You know, they lost the their jobs. Yeah, the skin, right? <laughs> what are the, um, in case you're wondering what he's talking about, there's a great quote in an interview with Gerald Gardner at the British Museum of Witchcraft where some guy asked him, what is the costume of a witch and he just goes the skin you know um, he was very theatrical but I liked that they were like that so yeah what advice would you give a person just beginning to explore traditional craft um, build up your tolerance for wine uh, aggressively <laughs> like aggressively no but all joking aside um, approach it as a priesthood if you don't you'll hate it um, period uh, it, you will hate it because it will seem like too much work, it will seem snobbish, it will seem elitist, it will seem detached. Um, if you don't approach it as priesthood, you won't like it. Um, so approach it as priesthood if, if that's what you want. Um, whatever you do, don't approach it as a hobby. Um, modern religions are hobbies in a lot of ways, and it's not a judgment, um, it's just what they are. Uh, you know, if you think about the shallowness of certain, not all, but certain converts to, for example, um, Buddhism in the West, where it's very much an image and it's, uh, it's all about how you feel and there's no actual approach to the philosophy that's not true there's many people who are very devout in it and you know do amazing work but there has been this rise ever since the 60s of viewing religions that are not necessarily new but new to the western you know western christendom or whatever as hobbies something you pick up and i think if you approach it like that you're going to hate it um, but if you approach it as devotion service priesthood power religion all of that and truly see it as um for lack of a better word a cult like um You'll, you'll like it, but that's what you have to go into it with. You will like it. You will like <laughs> it, right? Uh, in regards to craft, describe a pet peeve of yours. So many. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm not. I don't. Uh, my biggest one, and this I think might not be a popular opinion, is, um, is actually a pet peeve of the entire occult world, which is that it's, um, they have no perspective. I actually had a talk with somebody recently about this. Uh, very, very deep talk. Uh, one of our coven members. Um, I, I'm very grateful that before I, I was a priest, I was a Catholic, a very devout one, very, very devout, and then left that and was a very angry and bitter non-believer, right? So I traveled in both of those worlds, the fanatically dogmatic, the fanatically material, you know, materialist in the philosophical sense, and I had that perspective of, we're all kooks to these people, every one of us. Um, everyone, everybody in this room that you can't see, people, you know, in this video, but everybody who's into the occult, magic, whatever, you're all kooks. Like, welcome. Uh, and we lose that perspective, and so we start saying things like, I would never be British craft because it's not real. Um, it's not real the way trad craft is. And then somebody says, well, I would never be trad craft because it's not real because their books are poorly sourced or whatever. Crowley's the real deal. Salim is the real deal. Oh, well, no, he's not the real deal because he did drugs or because he had issues or because he was a misogynist or whatever. 
um, okay, well, Crowley's not the real deal, where, well, Voodoo and Salteria are the real deal. Well, not only if you go there, not here. So it becomes this game of, uh, and what they lack is this huge perspective of outside of this world, there is no difference. Crowley and, um, and the most, like, the lowest basest form of neo-paganism that's sold to the masses on the bookshelves, they're the same thing. To an atheist, secular humanist of the modern age, we're all the same. We believe in crazy stuff. We think Harry Potter's real. Um, you know, we watched too much Buffy growing up or whatever our sin was. You know, um, like, that's what they think about us. And I think it's important to remember that so that you don't lose sight of, you know, find something you love in the occult and the craft and do that. Don't try to find the real, the secret, the oldest, the most powerful. It doesn't exist. The most powerful people in the world are not occultists. They're, um, you know, they're, um, they're Wall Street hedge fund managers, and they don't believe in anything but themselves. Um, and you don't want to be those people, or maybe you do, but um, I don't. And um, you just don't. I mean, I don't. I don't want to be those people. This may be my favorite video. And I want Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying my best. So yeah, so that's my biggest pet peeve. Have perspective. Remember, this is all made up nonsense to most of the world, but it means something super important to us. So latch on to it. Many members of the New Orleans Covenant are very public about the craft. Do you think this is necessary these days, or should witches be more secretive and private? Both. Um, I think... My favorite interview that Maxine Sanders has done recently is the one, you can see it online, um, of her at the British Museum of Witchcraft, and she's talking about this exact point at the end of the video. And she says um, that we are m it, the craft has become more open while simultaneously becoming more closed, which is what it needs to do. We need to be super open in the sense of like, we're here, we exist, we're proud of who we are, we have this lineage, we're not gonna let it die, we're not gonna let you know the elders go forgotten or whatever. But what we actually do is, n is no longer for sale. Like, um, you don't get to um, you don't get to play anymore with it. Uh, we get to play with it in public. So be public about it, but then also be aggressively secretive when you can. It's fun, you know. Be dichotomous. Be uh, be both things. There is a series that ep epitomizes this that I would highly recommend, and you don't have to watch the whole series. But there's a scene I'll recommend. It was called The Young Pope, and it's Jude Law, and um, it's a British show, but I think I think it's on HBO or Showtime in America, and it's about this very young American man who gets elected by the Cardinals to become Pope, and it's Jude Law. And he, uh, he, he's a fanatic, like a fanatic traditionalist. He brings back the papal tiara, he brings back the throne, um, and he shuts down the Vatican. No journalists are allowed in anymore. And he becomes an overnight sensation. He's a massive celebrity all of a sudden, because he's mean and closed off and secretive, but also popular. It's a game, right, where you get to see this public face, but what really goes on becomes this grand mystery. And I think we can keep that alive, and I think it works really well. Um, too that's public. sort of contrary to these videos. Probably, right? <laughs> but what have I told you about anything we do? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing, right? True. Nothing. And, and, and I think we need to be adamant about our secrecy, too. I think there is this misconception that it's all been spilled. You know, Aidan Kelly published the book, or Lady Sheba published the book, or um, it's all online. Um, it's all online. It's all published. It's not. And people think it is, and you can't convince them that it's not, because nobody wants, everybody has FOMO, fear of missing out. No, I've seen it all. No, you haven't. And, um, and if that bothers you, I'm kind of glad that it does. Good, let it bother you. You don't, you don't know the secrets, you don't know the mysteries, and even if you did, even if you had every page of the book, you couldn't recreate my religion, you're not a priest. Mm -hmm. And we get to claim that, in the same way that Catholics get to claim that Lutherans are not Catholic. You know, there's no, there's no cruelty in that. If you can't be friends with somebody um, while simultaneously disagreeing with them, what kind of friend are you? So I can be friends with solitary witches and neo-pagans and, and Thelemites and all kinds of different people and be like, well, you're still not my thing and that's cool, it's fine. But be secretive, be aggressively secretive. Do you have any parting words for the people of Facebook or YouTube? I don't know, I'm good, I think. I think uh, I'm good. <laughs> well, thank you for being interviewed, uh, blessed be. Blessed be.